um, thank you for your interest in this topic. Um, I'm going to look at this issue. I think you probably a lot of information out there around refugee issues and what's going on. I'm going to try and link it more to what's happening to York, try to show a little bit of the history and York's role in, in, in this process and ongoing. So to give you a bit of what's the theme, and uh, it's roughly it's what I'm going to do, go through the bit of the history, uh, the role of Howard Edelman, who's here at York, the Syrian refugees, Canada's response, and then looking at some of the current policy and processes that are going on. One to, we know when we talk about certainly uh, refugees and migration, we have to recognize that, of course, the first people here were the First Nations, and that uh, on the lands of this university, the people of the Mississaugas of New Credit, First Nation, and the uh, Haudenosaunee Confederacy peoples that occupied the land that we are um, on today. There we are. Just to go back to some of the context in terms of what's a refugee, and if those are probably familiar with this, the United Nations Protocol and the Convention, that refugees are people who have to be outside of their country. So people have had to cross the border, and they're unable or unwilling to return because of a well-founded fear of persecution. And that fear can be on the basis of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. And Canada has actually been providing some leadership around the definition of a particular social group. Uh, for instance, we now have developed protocols around women being recognized in terms of fleeing um, abuse and also LGBT issues. And uh, there is also this policy of non refoulement So you cannot return somebody to a country where they are at risk of uh, their life or freedom could be threatened. So even if, if people have, um, for some reason, are decided that they don't have refugee status or whatever, they, can, they cannot deport people to a country where they're at risk. You must be able to keep them. This is sort of looking at the global situation, um, and it's a bit mixed because we don't have the full stats for 2015, and they sent stats out in mid 2000, um, June 2015, so I've tried to put these together. But certainly, globally, over 60 million people are displaced. And even since that, that was last June, um, that will be higher because we're seeing more and more people, particularly, and of course, Syria has been the main site, but there are other places. Um, Eritrea or Ethiopia and South, South Sudan have been other places. And so over 20 million have been identified as refugees that they're under the mandate of UNHCR or, or Palestinians. And the concern also is that you know, half of these are kids, half of the population, and half of them are female. So we, the kids are on the move with their families trying to get uh, security and safety. We have 18.8 million asylum seekers, so these are people, and that number will also be higher, or have gone to a country to claim um, refugee status. Last year in Canada, 16,521 people claimed refugee status in Canada, because of course we make it very hard for people to get here. In Germany, they processed a million people, and I was at a workshop yesterday with people from Germany, and the politicians there are saying they expect another million people this year. So what we are facing with Canada just pales in comparison to what the Germans. But they are working very hard to deal with that. They were very positive about how they're trying to integrate, looking at their strategies of integrating, they're building housing. Uh, so they see this as part of their role and responsibility to the world making great leadership. Um, Angela Merkel is providing outstanding leadership to us in the world around dealing with refugee issues. And of course, many people are displaced internally, and that's certainly we see that in Sudan, other countries, um, in, in Syria. And 10 million stateless people, people end up without having a papers that are attaching them to a country. And that's quite problematic when they try to move. This last is sort of interesting, given all these mil and millions in the last 10 years, 900,000 people were resettled. That is, that they were taken from a country and brought to another safe country, a third country, like Canada, US, Australia. 900,000 over 10 years, it's not a lot when you look at the numbers that we're facing. This when you, we define refugees, uh, different groups, so the government assisted refugees, and these are people that Canada will go and 
uh, usually in um, often in a camp or in countries like, um, for instance, we have processing in Beirut going on right now, Lebanon, will identify people as um, refugees, They're usually referred by UNHCR, United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees, would have referred them. And then we bring them to Canada after quite to a process. And I think recently with the Syrians coming, uh, that process has been more clarified. So they've been reassuring people around security. So they're, they're interviewed um, by a visa officer at the site. They have, they're doing biometrics on people. They check those biometrics with CSIS, our intelligence agency. They're checked with RCMP, the Mounted Police. And then when they arrive at the border, they also checked at our border with the um, border services. So they have all these security checks. In fact, recently, uh, government officials had to go to the state Senate committee in the US to assure them that we were doing sufficient security checks so that they would be, and they were assured that we were. So privately sponsored refugees, and, and then of course, when they're here, they're also given support for one year. So people will come, uh, agencies, what's called RAP agencies, resettlement assistance programs, there are 36, I think not 38, they just established two more, one in Leamington and Peterborough. So the effort to try and move people to some of the more um, mid middle areas. And, um, but they are sponsored by private folks. Groups of people get together and commit to usually raising about $30,000 to support the family for the first year. They're providing accommodations, usually pay for their flights, accommodations, uh, food, uh, help furnish the apartment and get them supported and help net them network in order to get uh, employment or in network with services. We haven't been looking much at the comparison, so actually we've just put in a big funding proposal we hope we get to do some uh, comparison of the GARs and PSRs. There's a new group that's been called a hybrid. It was recently done. And these are um, blended visa office referred <laughs> refugees long-term. But that's often for people who are more at risk. So people with the government is trying to sort of support um, private sponsors. And so we will say, we will fund for half if you fund the other half. And often we may have people who may be a bit more vulnerable and may require extra assistance. Then of course we have the inland program. So people who can get, this is 16,000 who got here last year and claim refugee status as, as they get here. And um, it's that number, it was at an all time low about 10,000 a few years ago, but uh, it's getting a bit higher, but it's very difficult because of the use of visas, um, you know, because you can't get in a rubber dinghy and come to Canada. So, and if you try to cross from the US border, we have a safe third country agreement. So if people try to claim with few exceptions, they get turned back and told to claim refugee status in the US. So it's very difficult to, to get to Canada. But then when people do get recognized for um, uh, refugee status, which all in here in Canada means you're on the pathway to citizenship, uh, their family members can be brought here to be with them. When a part of the history, and I'll go into some of the history, but Canada has had, let's say a bit of a mixed history around refugees and immigrants. And one of the very, I guess, low lights of our history was in 1939. This is a boat of over 900 Jewish refugees fleeing um, Europe. And they had originally tried to go to Cuba. They were turned back. They stopped in at places along the US. They were turned back. They tried to stop at Canada. They were turned back and sent back to Europe. And many of them died in the Holocaust. So this was partly this low time and re reflected a really, I mean, there was quite an anti-Semitism um, uh, presence in our immigration uh, program at that time. And other groups have been targeted over time too. I'll come back to this because it's um, it becomes significant too. So we look at this history, there are other more positive pieces. We have a history of bringing people in particular in response to emergency situations. So Hungarians in uh, 56, 57, and again, using flights, brought people over by flights. Another large group, you know, in 1968, Canada recognized that um, deserters from foreign armies could be allowed to claim refugee status, or at least come in, actually. They didn't even have to claim, they could be come in. And tens of thousands came in, and we don't really know how many, because there wasn't really any documentation. Um, also, the, the different, I mean, you see the different crises over time, the, the time of the Czech 
checks came in 68. And this was interesting because also it was a time that organizations sort of came together and trying to support and assist them. So you get that sense of a civil society getting engaged. 1969, Canada finally signed the Convention um, on Refugees, that UN Convention and the 67 Protocol. 72, 73, when Idi Amin sort of banned all Asians out of Uganda, Canada stepped in and received them. Britain was refusing them initially, even though they had British passports. And um, 40, well, over 4,000 actually brought in by flights. So we have this pat you know, pattern of actually bringing people in in large mass in flights. What's interesting in the Immigration Act of 1976 did many things. Um, that's when they introduced the point system for migration. But it also was the first time that refugees were recognized as a separate migration group. And it's also when they set up the private sponsorship program, allowing us encouraging private sponsorship of refugees, not just government, which becomes quite significant in a um, few years. And so 1978, 79, when we have the um, Vietnam, there's sort of the collapse of the South Vietnam and uh, um, the whole movement, uh, people from the Indo-Chinese includes Laos, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, becoming what we saw then again as the boat people. And here we have, again, the, the involvement at York University. Uh, people may know Howard Edelman. He was a professor here in philosophy. He's now retired. And he began to uh, organize what he became Operation Lifeline. So he gathered people together. They met at his home. Uh, Joseph Wong, a doctor in Toronto, the department was part of that. And they formed the group. They said, you know, in, in, we can do this. We can be bringing people in. We have this piece of the legislation. And they started talking to mainly to faith communities to form support networks to bring people in. I don't know if anyone here is involved with that at that time. But certainly there was, so many people were involved, certainly at York. And, um, and Howard had people calling him from across the country. And so there was this big movement to try and bring people in. And it put some pressure on the federal government to also, at the time, to begin to think about what they were, their response was going to be. One of the things that they did, I'm going to skip ahead. And I'll just put back also, remember, the 1999, we had the cost of ours also. We flew them over. And in terms of the Indo-Chinese, um, in one year, one year, we brought 60,000. So that was a, a massive movement. And if, if people are interested, there is the, the migration workers, the federal migration workers, Mike Malloy, have formed a, a historical society and they have a website and they have some of the documentation of who went where. And that's very, it's fascinating if you know who's historical interest to read. But in one year, brought 60,000. And um, the majority in that time were, were privately sponsored. These people across the country had mobilized and organized and said, we will take these folks. And the rest were government sponsored. But how we got there, oh, then in Canada was actually awarded the Nansen Award, the UN Nansen Award um, by the High Commissioner. And it was a, we were given it as a country, it often goes to individuals, but we were given it as a country in terms of recognizing our sustained contribution to the cause of refugees. But getting there was a bit of a challenge, and I think that you can see how things can happen. Um, when Howard was organizing people, one of the people that got involved, and people may know Irving Abella, he's a historian here at York. Howard, uh, Harold Trober is an historian at the Uni uh, University of Toronto in Oise. They were writing this book, None is Too Many, and they had a draft of it. And the draft got to Ron Atkey and got to the cabinet of, of government of Canada. And when they read it, um, this sort of changed, and they had really influence about their position. And of course, this goes back to the, the vote of the uh, St. Louis coming. And at the time, Canada was asked, how many Jewish refugees are you going to take? And the response of a senior staff person was, none is too many. So when the cabinet read the draft of this book, it had quite an impact on them. It said, we cannot repeat this history. We cannot do this again. We have to respond. We have to do this differently. So then you end up, um, in terms of Howard getting involved, people moving, the, uh, Flora McDonald, there was a brief period where the Joe Clark government was there. Flora McDonald was the Minister of Migration, Immigration. She goes off to UNHCR. They had called you know, the states together in terms of what's your response going to be. 
She left apparently with a mandate to bring 5,000. And somehow between here in Geneva and when she's there in the room, and I guess the pressure back home, she announced Canada would bring 50,000. <laughs> so it's a big shift. So that was, uh, so I guess, and of course, then you can see, and people like Mike Malloy, who were held responsible for organizing that response there, certainly got very, very busy in terms of how they were going to do this. So there's a sense of also how knowledge and information and how, how decisions can get made, you know, and, and the politics of these kinds of decisions. We've also, here at York, it's been a lot of work being done around the Indo-Chinese refugee movement. Um, uh, recognizing sort of the 40th year recently, and uh, there is a website that's been looking at and collecting data around that. This is one of the images here. Um, James Simeon here at York has been working with Mike Malloy. One of the also significant pieces too at that time, Howard Edelman in terms of the, the uh, Operation Lifeline, we also at York started uh, being a place for documenting arrivals. A bit of like almost a legal clinic got set up at York and we're, they were helping with the processing of the documentation. In fact, when I arrived as director in 2004, I found these boxes and realized that they were actually files. They were family files that were just sitting in boxes in the open. They are now over being archived at the library. And um, so part of that, that became as a documentation center was established here at York. And in 1988, that became the Center for Refugee Studies. And Howard Edelman was the first uh, director. And so it became recognized at York as a research unit. So we really came, our roots came out of the Indo-Chinese uh, refugee movement and the direction and leadership that Howard and his colleagues gave in terms of mobilizing the Canadian response. And there, and it's not a great photo, I took it, but the, um, <laughs> the Vietnamese community in November um, had a grand celebration at Holy Blossom Church because they were recognizing the people from that uh, church, Holy Blossom Temple, and they were synagogue. They were recognizing the people from that synagogue in terms of support they had provided, and they gave Howard an award in terms of recognizing his contribution. I was there that evening, it was an amazing evening. You can see big tables and of uh, Vietnamese families, now you know, grown adults. Uh, one fellow spoke, he is now a medical doctor with his kids, talking about how important this experience was and how, I mean, clearly these people have been thriving and contributing to our society. And still the relationships were there, so they were sitting there with their sponsors. So 40 years later, they had kept up those relationships and, and contacts. So then we come to Syria. And um, certainly this is just looking at some of the, um, the movements. We can help, when you look at this map, you can understand some of the movement. I think about 2.7 million Syrians have been displaced to Turkey. And so we've seen the debate this past week in terms of the EU trying to negotiate with Turkey. Will you keep them there? The argument is keep them there and they're, you know, when, when peace comes, they're gonna be handy so they can return. I think we're all wondering when the peace is gonna come, but anyway, that's. And so also Lebanon, a million in Lebanon. Lebanon's only a country, about four million. They have a million Syrian refugees and Jordan and Iraq also have just under a million each. And then, then there are uh, more people just uh, placed inside Syria. And so we also have then is the movement, people trying to get into Turkey and to make their way over to Greece and make their way up through Europe. And, and if you've been following the news, this is becoming much more difficult. We have Macedonia, the people cleaning you know, the Balkans are trying to close the borders. People um, in terrible situations on the, on the border of Macedonia and Greece. Um, just thinking that there has to be a better way. Um, you know, and the pressure on different countries in the EU to try and receive refugees. Germany has certainly taken the most and um, we're expecting, as I said earlier, we're expecting to take more, but it's become a real, um, a, a massive issue and, and it's a global issue. We can't just stand by and watch this happening. And I'm, I'm of concern too is that even though we have Syria, but there are other issues that are fermenting and this is coming almost the new normal in terms of pressure on people to move. And as we also look at the issues around climate change, we also see there's gonna be more and more displacement. So we have to think globally, think about what is our role in this and how are we gonna contribute? 
And I think now, I mean, Canada is really, I think, thinking about that, uh, particularly with this new government. I just have some of the photos that, you know, this is what people are prepared to do, you know, these dangerous routes that they're doing to try and um, get to safety. Oops. Um, arriving and children again, I'm saying half of the uh, people leaving are children and um, we get them as young as this little guy here too. And then Canada's been working to welcome. You know, we made a commitment, the government just got elected and made 25,000. I mean, it seems small when you think of Germany's receiving a million, but we did commit to 25,000. And this is one of the views in terms of the Toronto airport. And this is it, in terms of selfie. So the prime minister is there, <laughs> and the Syrian woman wants to have her picture taken with the prime minister. So we've got that kind of engagement. So people are, are arriving here. What we've also seen, of course, is the a change in our government, which has also meant a change in terms of direction around migration. And for those of us in the field, it's a very welcome change. Um, it's a good start, and how can we continue to do more? So in fact, they've revised the plans, the targets for this, this year, 2016, were just released on Wednesday, and uh, we see this shift um, to refugees, considerable, uh, more than doubling the number of refugees that we expect to come in, and increasing the family total too. So more resettlement of families. In fact, the, also the program that's in place um, to bring uh, <coughs> grandparents and, and parents and you, people you have to apply in the beginning of the year, it's quite controversial, but the government did double that number. Um, but ideally that number will continue to increase. So the goals actually are not, the numbers are not, they're, they're quite consistent. We've consistently had goals of total migration between 250 and 300,000. Historically, between the inland claimants and resettled refugees, they've been about, refugees have made up about 10%. This looks like it'll be a bit more. Oh, no, it's not working. Um, in terms of, this is a plan in terms of refugees particularly coming. Uh, they expect to be 11,000. These would be dependents, people who get status here and then bring families later. Resettled refugees, that's 44,000 in total. 24,000 will be government sponsored. And the, the way the numbers work, because they committed to 25,000, that they were to be all government sponsored refugees. But in the group that they brought, they, they couldn't get enough government sponsored. So some of those are private sponsored. So they still have about 10,000 government sponsored from their commitment from last year. So that would be part of this, but then be another 14,000. The blended office um, referral, but also the privately sponsored. So about 20,000 are going to be private sponsored and about 20, well, over 24,000 will be government sponsored. So it's a significant increase um, in terms of the number of refugees, but the indication I think now that the agencies have been through it and um, we're, I mean, it is showing up some of the challenges. It's not the problem of the refugees. The problem is that as a country, we do not have adequate affordable housing for low income people. And we don't have a childcare program for it that is adequate in terms of. So these are just showing up some of the profound structural problems that we have that all low income people face. And because when refugees come and they are, their income that they're given that first year is at the level of social assistance. Well, I think you must know how inadequate social assistance is. So it's a bit of a struggle. And for those who are doing private sponsorship, they have to be careful. You can't get them into housing that they aren't gonna be able to support themselves after that first year. So our, it's showing up our housing problem. It's also the sense of trying to move people from some of the um, uh, major cities, you know, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal have been always the major centers, trying to move it out to some of the um, smaller areas. Although housing is not always that readily available either. Some of the policy issues that have come up around this, um, you know, this balance, the increasing the number of uh, government sponsored and private so sponsored. It looks like for this year, the target is 44,000. Well, we can maintain that. My view would like at least maintain that. Um, that, that. That should be our goal now. And, um, and then maybe even see if we can do more. That these also will be not just Syrian refugees, but they will also be refugees from other sites because we've got people in terms of um, fleeing South Sudan is uh, a very difficult place right now. We've seen Burundi, so several African countries that there are this massive displacement taking place. Historically, when re uh, refugees came, 
They've been charged, and as they put it back in place last week, they get charged for the cost of the flight. So they arrive with a debt. And so now you're on trying to live on social assistance, you may have trying to get your kids established, you're trying to find a job, you're trying to do language training, and you have a debt, and it could be up to $10,000. So this has been a great burden on families. During this time of bringing the 25,000, the government waived that because of course they were doing charter flights, which turned out to be more expensive than if you just put people on a regular flight. Um, but so they waived in that period, but they put it back in place. The policy act was trying to say, okay, let's eliminate that and cover those travel costs. The issue around settlement services, you know, the adequacy of the funding for those agencies, because if we're bringing more people, do we need more staffing? But in fact, I don't know, understand the rationale, but I was meeting with some EDs of agencies and many of them have given notices that their funding has been cut by certain percentage this year. I don't know how we balance that. The issue around location, can we move them to more mid-sized communities? Um, and then the issue around language classes. We provide language, but they, we really need to look at how we do language. You know, if we have people who may be illiterate in their first language, you cannot, don't put them in a class with people who have different levels. We have to look better at the levels. We have to make sure there's childcare available so women can get into the language classes. And we have to have them available in the evening so people can, um, if they're working, can take language classes in the evening. So there's some challenges around that. The issue of unemployment, these are, and these are issues placed, you know, faced by um, all migrants in terms of the recognition of the credentials that they have. How do we do that faster and better? Because people, when they're fleeing, don't come with their documents. And they can't write back, oh, send me the transcript from that college or university. It's not there. It's not going to happen. There's been some innovative stuff going on. The BC construction industry, working with uh, the, the ministry, is actually sort of recruiting people. They're identifying people who have some trade abilities, forming them into pods, making sure one person's English speaking so that they can help with the others and then are putting them into apprenticeship programs, four-year apprenticeship programs paid. And at the end of this year, those people are going to have trades and good jobs. And the industry, construction industry has workers, which they need. That's the kind of innovation that we need to be thinking about. As I said earlier, affordable housing and access to childcare are issues. Access to education is an issue. Um, you know, trying to get into, like, affording university or colleges. These are major barriers uh, to people trying to get into trade programs. So how do we look at how we can support people so they can become um, contributing and, and in good, have the potential to get into good jobs? I mean, you know, the, the joke is here, what if you have a heart attack, hope you have it in a taxi, because odds are the driver is a doctor. And one of my students, I said that class, and one of my students says, that's my father. You know? So this is happening. Um, people are, you know, and they end up with skilled people are cleaning our offices at night, and usually often there's a language barrier. So how do we do that? One of the things we're looking at in terms of the integration models, and working with my colleague, Michaela Hinney, is around social cohesion. And um, I'll show you, her. this is her model. I'm not going to go into it. But the idea is that you see here in terms of the function is not. Anyway, the, the functional component there is the middle time. Usually people are saying, have they got a job? Have they got housing? You know, are they have access to health care? But this is arguing that, in fact, this is a much more inclusive process. You have to take it more holistic. And the evidence shows that the more engaged, the more social cohesion, people feel connected to the community, the better we all are off socially and economically. So how do we do this and how do we do this better? And the sense of this model also, and we're asking people that lower level is subjective in terms of the research, and hopefully we'll get our funding. Um, do people have a sense of belonging? How do they feel? Do they feel connected? And how important that is um, for people. And, and these people are making major transitions. And I think all of you, any of you have made migrations, know what that's like. And particularly coming as a refugee, it's much more, it's more, even more problematic. So how can we be then welcoming communities and how can we support <coughs> their settlement and integration. So this is the point, yes, because in welcoming communities are more prosperous and people feel they belong. There's some work going on around called community connections and trying to connect uh, refugees to services. And so how they also help them establish professional social networks so they are feeling engaged and welcomed. And um, 
So for instance, the TDSB, the Toronto District School Board, has set up this Newcomer Youth and Kids, a, a mentorship program so to help uh, uh, newcomers and that they're affiliated with uh, kids who are in the school system and help them become better integrated. One of the big concerns has been the young people, and there's been a lot, significant dropout of young people out of the high schools. Partly it's because some of the, the difficulties that they're having settling in terms of uh, language, but also pressure on them to get jobs. The family's struggling, and so, you know, at 16, the kids are having to get, go and get jobs in order to help keep the family going. So we have to try and, and sort of address some of these things. Was, I was curious that um, Toronto, City of Toronto just launched this, and I think this is this Ontario-wide public education campaign against xenophobia, Islamophobia, and racism. It's a long title. But I guess it's partly to and recognize that we need to do something and deal with it. There can be rumors out there that um, people, there's been fear-mongering. Certainly that comes, and I hate to say, you even recognize the man's name, but there's a man in the United States who's running for president who is <laughs> really, I mean, when it comes to fear mongering and how labeling and that in fact, you know, um, being Muslim is they just assume that that becomes a very negative vision. We have to stop that. And so how do we then recognize? And I think, I mean, we're fortunate here in Canada for the most part, you know, we, do value multiculturalism. We do try and work here in Toronto particularly. What, half the people in Toronto are born outside this country? So, you know, we have the experience of, of living and working side by side. It's not always perfect. Um, and of course, most of the students we have at this university are fit that uh, category, have been born outside, and they tell me, and I'm sure they tell the rest of us, how some of the difficulties that they're having uh, in the community, particularly if they're racialized. So having this campaign, I thought was really interesting that the city of Toronto particularly would take this on and to helping us look, look at our language, look at our discourse and our understandings and perceptions and of who's here and how we can, uh, I think, become what we see or see ourselves as being humanitarian, open and welcoming. But how are we doing that and are we doing that well? I want to talk then a little bit about York's response. Oh, God. I thought it was going to be too slow and I'm fast. Um, again, this has been interesting in terms of the uh, his response in terms of the Syrian refugee uh, you know, universities are in Toronto. The four universities, um, which has been York, OCAD, uh, U of T, and Ryerson, have formed um, this operation, Syrian, part of Syrian Lifeline. And that was established uh, initially, I think they planned to bring a thousand people to Toronto, and Ryerson was provided some leadership around this. So that has been started here at York. Um, Osgood Hall, Lauren Sasson, the Dean of the Osgood, is providing leadership. The Center for Refugee Studies is involved. We have a doctoral student, John Carla, who is helping provide some coordination to that. Um, so far, 82 groups of sponsorship groups among these four universities have been formed. So 82 groups have been established and are going to be then working to receive a family in, in Toronto. So, and I thought I was really impressed, because sometimes I think as, you know, as academics, so we can be a bit staid and, and um, sort of trying to keep it safe, but people are really reaching out and getting engaged, and uh, um, there's a, a quite an initiative. We've had people, the agencies coming, provide training in terms of uh, people understanding what you, what's the process of settlement, what you have to go through, one of the things we'd like to do in terms of some research, lots of potential research projects here, is also track some of the sponsorship. Because when, the, when we had the conference around the Indo-Chinese, one of the things we certainly saw was that um, there were breakdowns and there'd be sponsorship breakdowns. And how, if, how can we track that? How can we try to avoid those? And how we can help you know, so that uh, refugee families and the sponsoring group can stay connected with each other and the differences can be negotiated. Um, language is a bit of them, uh, but you know it's a big adjustment so for so many people and with the large families and, and coming here. So how can we make sure that that process is uh, supportive and people can stay engaged? And then how do we also, on the project, how do we see the advantages and the strengths of the different programs, of the government-sponsored and the private-sponsored? 
and what are the strengths from both and how can we then look at that and can we um, improve both of them and, and we're hoping if we can do that research. So this is the um, information and they gave me some uh, flyers and there were some out in the desk so anybody who's interested this is showing what uh, the York's response and some opportunities for training and information about what York's doing. So I guess York is saying in terms of refugees, we have a history um, and I think for the most part, very strong history in engaging on refugee issues. We have the Center for Refugee Studies uh, where uh, it's not just uh, faculty members, we have over 50 faculty members. What it creates is an opportunity for people from different disciplines. So I'm in social work, but I have colleagues in law and education and political science and history. And uh, so we all can be working together on these issues. And also we have a space for students to come. We have a very active student caucus. Um, they're so amazing. And again, they're from all different uh, departments of the university, but they come and work together at our center and they host a conference every year. Um, it's a graduate conference that's held and will be held this year in September. So it's a site for for gathering, for people to come together academically, and then we have strong connections with the community. We work pretty closely with the NGOs, um, the Canadian Council for Refugees. We have a strong as a need, that network of 180 agencies across the country that serve uh, refugees. And uh, so that we are affiliated with this, that uh, Canadian Council. I was just at one of their working group meetings two weeks ago. And um, we're also engaged with locally with the local NGOs here in Toronto. So trying to create sort of space, and I think this is important as academics, and I think York has really taken this on about community engagement. So we as academics, and it's not just going into the community and, and I'm gonna ask some questions, do my research and come back to the university and write it all up and file it away in some remote journal, that we actually really need to be more engaged with communities and work with communities. And so for instance, in the research project we just submitted, we had um, community agencies involved in the design of the research. So they were telling us about what can be done, what can we do, how can we do it? And they are partners in the research and they will be part of the, uh, doing the analysis with us. And then also be helping with the dissemination because if the research finds in terms of, you know, what can be improved in the government sponsored, what can be improved in the private sponsored, then we have uh, ways of putting that out.